All right. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. I think we are we are ready to start. Uh, we will start at least with the with the introductions and the opening remarks, um, just to give a couple of extra minutes for the colleagues that have just been allowed in the in the building to join us. Um, my name is Giacomo Persipaoli. Um, I'm the head of Unidir's Security and Technology Program, and it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you to this technology breakfast uh, here in New York and online where we'll be uh, exploring the uh, technology of, of quantum. And uh, we have heard of it. Some of us have heard more of it. Some of us have heard less uh, of it. I think it's fair to say that um, the, uh, the average knowledge of this technology remains uh, relatively uh, limited. Um, because t as of today, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, you know, when I joined Unidir in 2019, uh, we had an event, the, innovation, the first edition of the Innovations Dialogue, that looked also at quantum as one of the technologies. And back then, you know, the, one of the scientists said, we're probably you know, 15 years away from, um, from you know, the first kind of uh, uh, quantum capabilities to be deployed uh, at scale. Now, four years have passed, so in theory, we're approaching the 10-year mark. But I think there is still a lot of unknowns regarding the state of the, of the technology, regarding how it could be used, and what kind of uh, 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 challenges and opportunities it might bring. So the purpose of this technology breakfast that uh, is uh, uh, kindly supported uh, uh, by the European Union as part of a wider project that Unidir is conducting, looking at key enabling technologies, is really to provide a, a very informal and, and relaxed setup where after we hear uh, from our uh, expert speaker, uh, Dr. Zanna uh, Maleko-Smith, uh, uh, a short presentation, an introduction to this technology. This is really an opportunity for all of us to ask questions, hopefully get to some answers um, as much as we can, or if not, at least chart a better pathway towards uh, getting some of, these, uh, some of these answers. What is, for me, important to note is that based on my, uh, on my research in this, in this topic, despite the fact that this technology might appear to be far away in the future, that should not give us a, 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 a fake sense of uh, being protected and of safety. Because when this technology is, you know, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when this technology is going to be, be deployed, then the impact that it will have will be truly disruptive. So it is important that we do not wait uh, to see what happens when quantum capabilities are deployed, but we start thinking now about some of those scenarios and what possible options may exist for us. Um, before uh, I give the floor to, uh, uh, to Zanna here on my left, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Manon Leblanc, who is the head of international cybersecurity policy at the European External Action Service, for some opening remarks. Manon, over to you. Thank you very much. Um yes, okay. Thank you very much indeed uh, for um, um, having me and for organizing this. I think this is a very important and very timely uh, roundtable discussion. Um, I think we see also, and it's also recognized in the uh, current uh, draft report, uh, that new technologies, emerging technologies, uh, are of crucial importance. Uh, they are important to our society, to our economy, uh, and we need to make sure that uh, our citizens, our businesses can benefit from it, uh, and that we mitigate the risks uh, um, that might arise uh, from using them, uh, including uh, in the context of international security. So. Today is really also about learning a bit about these technologies, learning a bit about the implications specifically uh, on uh, uh, quantum technology uh, from the uh, foreign and security policy perspective, from the international security uh, uh, perspective. I'm myself uh, coming from uh, foreign service, so an MFA, uh, and uh, as the EU, we are doing a lot in this field, but those are indeed the European Commission colleagues, so the colleagues that work at the ministries of uh, interior affairs or economic affairs or the digital ministry or any of those ministries that deal with, those de with the development of these hardcore uh, technologies, with the regulation to mitigate uh, 
risks, uh, with the investments, uh, sometimes with the uh, governance structure uh, that is uh, to be put in place locally. Uh, and it's our job as uh, uh, foreign ministries, as diplomats, uh, to look at the international security perspective, to look at the international governance uh, issues in this context, the ethical standards uh, that are uh, and the values that are uh, involved uh, when uh, developing and deploying these technologies. Uh, and that's what today is about, is to really like to see, to learn, uh, to exchange views, to exchange knowledge, knowledge and best practices, uh, and to then, uh, on that basis, uh, try to uh, make uh, decisions and guide uh, the discussions, including uh, in the context of uh, this open-ended working group. And we hope that uh, with the adoption of uh, the annual progress report, we will have more of these <laughs> discussions, actually, including also uh, other stakeholders uh, to make sure that we are uh, fully aware and that we are fully informed uh, for that uh, decision-making. I mean, as said, under the EU's digital decade, uh, the EU uh, has uh, many initiatives uh, to advance uh, these technologies, but also blockchain, telecommunication technologies, uh, obviously artificial intelligence. Uh, recently, the EU has launched uh, a flagship, or the flagship was launched in 2018, but uh, we have uh, uh, deployed now six supercomputers, uh, quantum computers within the EU, so we're really making steps in this regard. But as said, uh, from the foreign security uh, policy angle, we're still looking at, okay, what that, what type of implications uh, does all that work um, have in, uh, in the field that we are actually uh, in. So, I welcome again you to this uh, round table. Thank you very much, uh, Giacomo, for uh, organizing this, uh, indeed as part of a wider EU project on unlocking new uh, emerging technologies and helping us to better understand these. And I'm looking forward to learn today, <laughs> myself, uh, and to a nice and interesting uh, exchange uh, as uh, one of uh, many to come. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Manon, for your uh, kind words. And um, I think without further ado now, I would like to give the floor to, to Zana here on my left. She's a, a senior associate at CSIS and a non-resident fellow with us at UNIDIR. Um, I have asked her to, you know, preparation for this briefing to be short with slides and make this, this presentation as interactive as possible. And she really took me seriously. She has brought props and cards. So we're gonna be able to, to uh, hopefully given the, the early time, at least here in New York, to have a very uh, uh, interactive um, discussion. So I think you also have some slides, Zanna. So I'm gonna ask my colleague, Wentin, if you can please uh, share them. I see them loading on my screen. We don't see, here we are. So they are also on the screen here in New York. So um, Zanna, over to you for the next 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Giacomo, and thank you, Mano. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the bizarre world of quantum mechanics. Or, as the physicist Albert Einstein described it, spooky. Quantum information science and technology could revolutionize the field of computing. It could also enhance the capabilities of sensors for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities to support military operations, as well as increasing the speed and the security of communication networks and potentially undermining them as well. But the focus of today's talk is on the potential of quantum computers and the associated cybersecurity risks that they pose to global peace and stability. So one goal of the presentation today is to highlight both the national and international security implications of quantum computing and post-quantum cryptography as it pertains to critical infrastructure and information and communications technologies. But the first question, what is a quantum computer? A quantum computer is a highly advanced computation device that is based on quantum systems. Now, these devices compute on atoms using information storage units called quantum bits or qubits. Quantum computers utilize a technique called amplitude amplification to perform searches faster in unstructured databases and execute complex mathematical problems more efficiently than regular digital computers that we use today. Examples of those mathematical formula include running discrete algorithms and prime factorization to enable code breaking against cryptographic protocols such as public key encryption and digital signatures. 
And that's alarming for several reasons. One, these security protocols that I've listed, they secure our day-to-day -day communications online in our financial transactions. The second concern around that is that quantum computers could potentially decrypt classified information stored on encrypted media that could have information regarding sensitive military operations or intelligence operations that now is known to an adversary. To be clear, quantum computers are very much still in their infancy phase, with many of the advancements largely being driven by the commercial sector, such as IBM, Google, Honeywell, etc. Countries are also investing very heavily in this technology, just to name a few, Australia, China, Japan, Canada, the United States, Germany, I could go on. But to date, no member state has developed a large-scale, all-purpose quantum computer capable of breaking modern encryption protocols. However, the competition to acquire one is on, which is why I specifically chose the theme of a chessboard, as you can see on the screen here, the idea of we're engaged in a strategic game of power to build one of these devices. So it's a theme as well as a mnemonic memory device to help us recall the concepts that we'll explore together today. The cybersecurity risks are here. Speaking to that concern, the presentation will cover a bit on what are harvest now, decrypt later cyber threats. We'll touch upon that in just a moment. The second goal of the talk today is to inspire a dialogue amongst member states about what should be done as a collective in considering multilateral policy as a convening vehicle to discuss the emerging threats around this nascent technology for information and communications technology. Apart from the code-breaking concerns around quantum computers, quantum computers could also enable advances in machine learning, a subfield of artificial intelligence. Such advances could spur improved pattern recognition and machine-based target identification for military operations. And in turn, this could, development, this could spur the development of more sophisticated lethal autonomous weapon systems, which some defense theorists have posited theoretically could be capable of selecting targets without the need for manual human control. And on that uplifting note, I've been asked to prepare some remarks on the basic principles of quantum mechanics that are both informative and entertaining. And armed with my cup of coffee this morning, I intend to do exactly that. Uh, this presentation was specially designed to have a little bit of everything for everyone. If you enjoy the game of chess, we'll have ancient philosophy, a bit of mystery, and for those that are simply hungry, breakfast is kindly being served in the lobby. Uh, lastly, I wish to thank you all for your time today with me, Unidir, for the opportunity and the honor to present to you all and acknowledge the outstanding contributions of my research team at West Point, the U.S. Military Academy, Mr. Christopher Conan, Connor Leggett, Riley Hoyas, and Christopher Hewn, Christina Hewn. So let's begin. According to the chess grandmaster, Jose Raul Capablanca, to succeed, quote, you must study the end game before anything else. For us, understanding the end game first requires a mastery of the basic principles of quantum mechanics in order to understand how certain quantum phenomena can enhance information technologies, whether that's advancing discoveries in machine learning or improving the ability to run simulations for pharmaceutical research or uh, dealing with the material sciences. Next slide, please. Thank you. Please allow me to explain to you the difference between a classical bit and computing in comparison to a quantum bit, a qubit. Regular digital computers encode information in bits that can represent a binary state of zero or one. So let's imagine when I hold the pawn piece upright like this, the bit is in a charged state of one. What is it charged by? Millions of electrons. When I invert it, it is in an uncharged state of zero. So classical bits can occupy either one of two states. One or zero. Contrast that with qubits. With a quantum computer using qubits to encode information, a qubit can exist in a continuum of states simultaneously. So it's not just one or zero, it's one and zero, and it's at all orientations at the same time. That's superposition. Why? Because electrons can be in two places at the same time. So imagine one qubit has the computing potential of occupying two states at the same time. 
If I had two qubits, it would be four states at the same time. And if I had a third hand with three qubits, it would be eight states at the same time. Why is this significant for the power of quantum computers? The power of a quantum computer increases exponentially with the addition of each qubit that we add to our system. Regular digital computers apply an algorithm to one input at a time. However, quantum computers apply an algorithm to all inputs at once, that's superposition. And it also incorporates a property called entanglement, which is defined as when two or more objects or qubits, let's say, in our system can be intrinsically linked such that the measurement of one dictates the potential outcome for the other, regardless of how far apart they are. Now, due to the high sensitivity of quantum states, which can be disrupted by small disturbances in the environment, such as movement, such as measurement, when we take a measurement of the state, we are distilling it down, collapsing it, if you will, into a classical state of either zero or one. And that's significant because these disturbances cause quantum systems to act more like classical systems. So time is of the essence when we are operating with quantum systems. I'm going to move on now to discussing the cybersecurity risks around this technology, noting that thanks to parallelism, quantum computers could theoretically break modern asymmetric cryptographic protocols such as RSA encryption, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and digital signatures. And again, this poses risks to in sensitive encrypted information relating to military and intelligence operations. Next slide, please. So if the end game on our theoretical chessboard is developing a large all-purpose quantum computer capable of breaking modern encryption protocols, then the middle game strategy here is what is known as a harvest now, decrypt later cyber attack. And this refers to a scenario where malicious actors exfiltrate and store encrypted data today to then decrypt it in the future when post-quantum cryptography algorithms are accessible. Now, this particular nature of threat exploits delays with implementing more advanced security protocols. So to help illustrate this point, imagine, if you will, that if I am a bad actor trying to glean information on my adversary, what I've exfiltrated today from Giacomo, I have a red card and a blue card here. And from uh, Manoa, I have also exfiltrated, thank you, data from her <laughs> systems. Now, they were wise in that they executed um, the proper transition, pardon me, the, the proper transition to some of their systems to post-quantum uh, cryptography protocols. However, the data that I have stolen from them using the public key encryption methods now, going to the future, that I have a quantum computer capable of breaking that, I am now able to decrypt this information. Even though they have already taken the steps today, 2023, to fortify their systems with post-quantum cryptography, with these systems here that I've captured today, 2023, I might not have that capability, but in, let's say, 2025, when that tipping point occurs, I can now see what the sensitive communications were. So that, in theory, is a harvest now, decrypt later attack. It exploits the delays in implementing more resilient post-quantum cryptography. Scientists, as well as policymakers, are slowly preparing for this tipping point that I described in the field of cryptography. And this forum is an opportunity to begin having discussions around what should that look like? How should we best prepare for that tipping point in the field of cryptography? To present to you the other side of the coin, some scholars are quite skeptical of the likelihood of states actually developing a cryptanalytically relevant computer and the immediate risks posed by this data security threat. Although no quantum computer is presently equipped with enough qubits to execute, for example, Shor's algorithm on breaking asymmetric cryptographic protocols, again, the middle game strategy here that we should be concerned about is the harvest now to crypt later attacks. Acknowledging these risks later on uh, will only prolong the higher risks of privacy and also the vulnerabilities presented to cryptographic systems and information and communications technologies. In other words, why not lay the foundations today to better prepare for that worst case scenario rather than during the actual crisis, rather than when we have the harvest now to crypt later attack? Now, no human knows the future with certainty, and I don't lay claim to that capability in describing to you 
the possible future outcomes of post-quantum cryptography. As the wise Solon of Athens sagely pointed out to King Croesus at a lavish banquet centuries ago, quote, the future bears down upon each of us with all the hazards of the unknown, and we can only count a man happy when the gods have granted him good fortune to the end. Now, in that same spirit, it's a very ambitious undertaking to propound to you a theory today about how quantum technology will shape the future of warfare, especially given the fragile state and the nascent state of quantum systems that we described with the properties of decoherence and the competition to develop this technology. In that spirit, next slide, please. Perhaps the expression Festina Lente should serve as the contemporary motto for championing responsible global quantum innovation. Festina Lente translates to make haste slowly. It expresses the idea that doing something right the first time saves time. And it was a popular motto of Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar. And this maxim can be extended to the high stakes geopolitical competition around quantum computers and post-quantum cryptography algorithms. As states pursue quantum technologies, the legal and ethical considerations, which Manoa talked about in her opening remarks, must be carefully considered to avoid potential unwanted second and third order effect harms. As quantum technology becomes universal, it will test the mettle of an international rules-based order in ways that we are not today prepared for. Again, this forum is an opportunity to begin a discussion around these concerns and issues. How can we collaborate together as a global collective? For all these reasons, Festina Lente is a fitting North Star, I would argue, for policymakers to convene and discuss in multilateral fora how can we use the existing agreements and norms that we have for responsible state behavior in cyberspace around this existing, excuse me, around this potential uh, technology for quantum computers and post quantum cryptography. And with that, I thank you for your time, your patience in explaining quantum mechanics. I will turn the mic over to Giacomo. Thank you. Thank you, Zanna, for uh, this uh, illuminating presentation. I think it's, uh, it's, you did a great job in, in providing at least everyone with the same foundational uh, uh, layer of knowledge. And uh, um, I would now you know, would like to, to open the floor to any comments or questions or remarks, uh, either here in, in New York or if colleagues that are following us online. Um, would like to uh, to ask a question, please feel free to do so in the chat, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it back here to the room. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to to summarize quant quantum physics in, in 20 seconds, but uh, what, I, what I got out of your presentation is, is that, like most technologies, um, quantum will, will provide opportunities in the same way that it will provide risks. It can be used to make uh, our data and our information uh, more uh, resilient, uh, you know, more uh, uh, reinforced encryption. But at the same time, the same technology could be used to compromise information and, and data security. Uh, to me, the, the concept of harvest now, decrypt later, it's something that um, should not be downplayed. We know that the policymaking community tends to focus on now, and maybe tomorrow or five years is already a relatively, you know, uh, 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 long-term horizon when it comes to strategies. Most national security strategies don't even get to the five-year mark before they are renewed again. So to me, the, the, the risk of the, the uh, harvest now, the crypt later is important because you know, the, the kind of the state apparatus, when it classifies things, it does so with the assumption that those classified information is gonna remain so for 20 years, 25 years until they are declassified and make publicly available. But what happens if something that you classify today, thinking that it will be stay classified for the next 25 years, in two years becomes, you know, uh, decryptable? And, you know, and then there is a leak. And then, I mean, there, there are all of these scenarios are scenarios that are worth exploring today. I don't think we can necessarily come up with the silver bullet solution, but it's definitely something that governments, both individually and collectively, should, should reflect on. And then you also elaborated on the, on the wider, you know, there is the encryption, decryption, 
that is one angle, and the other angle is, is just that these are going to be extremely powerful computers. So anything that is possible with computers that we have today will become exponentially better once these, com these quantum computers become, become available. And uh, in, you know, in the OWG in, in March, in the, in the last session, quantum was highlighted as a risk, AI was highlighted as a potential new technology that can create concerns from an international uh, uh, cybersecurity perspective. Well, when you have the convergence of quantum and AI, then the risks can you know, compound as well. So um, there is even that angle to take into uh, account. But with that, I now would like to, um, please, hold on, over to you. Thanks for breaking the ice. <laughs> No, I have, I have a question. Uh, while I'm also processing uh, a lot of what you've said, but uh, I'm hoping I'm not the only one. I'm guessing I'm not the only one. Um, so what I understand that you say is that there's um, the technology uh, will evolve uh, and we will never be able actually to uh, secure our data at this that we produce at this moment in a future time um, because of the fact that these uh, capabilities are just, they do not exist. And for many states, they will, might never exist, right? So the idea that we only have a technological solution with post-quantum encryption is not, is not the answer. So the, there's a combination between there's an answer in the technology and in the capabilities and we can maybe conduct capacity building on that to raise awareness about the technologies and to you know, make sure that it's broadly available to states. But there's also the normative aspect to it because in the end, the technology will never solve our problem. Then I come to the normative framework, what we are <laughs> about. Um, uh, and then the question is, okay, we have the international law which applies. Uh, there's... Um, uh, several articles that would uh, apply in this case, uh, including also about interference and et cetera. Um, there's 11 norms. To what extent um, are these norms not applicable to this situation? Because if I would look at these new technologies, if we're talking about critical infrastructure, for instance, and the protection of critical infrastructure, that norm <coughs> would be applicable whether it's quantum or whether it's regular technology. And, and my question is, how do you see that? Um, how do you see the application of the current normative framework to the uh, technology? That is an excellent question. I, I'm very glad that you... Thank you for that excellent question, uh, Manoa. And I'm very glad that you referenced the potential for cyber capacity building in this domain. Um, both the political and, and the technical capabilities around cyber capacity building to address harvest now to crypt later attacks. Again, as Giacomo noted in his remarks, it's not a question of if crypto analytically relevant uh, quantum computers will be developed, but a matter of when. And we should be concerned today about the real immediate cybersecurity risks posed by harvest now to crypt later attacks, as shown with the uh, flashcard. Uh, diagram uh, example that I had here with uh, while my adversary they have some of their systems trans transitioned over to resilient post quantum cryptography as shown with the blue cards the data that I have exfiltrated today and stored I might not be able to um, make sense now of the encrypted information using public key encryption but when we reach that tipping point and I do have that capability then the sensitive military information the sensitive intelligence information becomes known to the adversary so it's important to highlight the immediacy of of that threat even though we have not yet attained a, a quantum computer that is capable of breaking uh, modern asymmetric cryptographic protocols in regards to the potential for the 11 norms, I think that that's an excellent idea to explore in, in a forum such as this today of how can we use the pre-existing infrastructure, the 11 voluntary norms for protecting information, um, information and communications technology when it comes to the challenges and opportunities around quantum technology. Uh, further discussion should be had of what does that look like? What is responsible state behavior when we have a cryptanalytically uh, relevant computer? Now, 
a component of that when we look at the, the language of the uh, 11 voluntary norms and also in conjunction with the potential of how the sustainable development goals could be used as a vehicle to promote stability in this area, we see that some of the norms promulgate states should respond to appropriate requests for assistance by another states whose critical infrastructure is subject to malicious ICT acts. What does that look like with Harvest Now Decrypt Later attacks? I don't know, but it's, it merits a discussion of how uh, that norm applies when we have post-quantum cryptography threats. Should cyber capacity building include helping countries develop and transition to post-quantum cryptographic algorithms? Uh, the National Academy of Sciences concludes here in the United States that the development, standardization, and deployment of post-quantum cryptography is critical for minimizing the chance of a potential security and privacy disaster. Again, the information intercepted by your adversary today prior to the deployment of post-quantum cryptography would not be protected once we reach that tipping point. So it's an excellent question, Manoa. Thank you. And just to add to that, and then I'll, I'll give the floor. I think it's a, um, the way in which norms are, are, are phrased today, well, it's the technology neutral approach, right? So there is no reference to any specific technology, but I think what I can potentially see becoming a challenge is that in the implementation of some of these norms, or at least some of them, the introduction of quantum could potentially if not raise the bar, definitely move the, the goalpost even even further. You know, when the norm that, that calls for states to protect, take steps to protect their own critical infrastructure, what does that look like? You know, what does that protection look like? Um, uh, or um, even, uh, uh, you know, states not knowingly support or allow their territory to be used to, 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 to conduct malicious cyber act. Now, what does that look like in, in post-quantum? Does that cover behavior, malicious behavior done today with the view of decrypting in, in, in 10 years. So how does the time factor play into that? I mean, these are potential nuances. I mean, uh, uh, anyone that has been following the discussion knows that there are, these, these are potentially smaller scale uh, uh, issues compared to some of the bigger topics that have been discussed in the room. Nevertheless, they're worth exploring. Um, I, there was a, a question here, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Jordan representing the Royal Academy of Science International Trust and their Royal Highnesses Prince Adnan El Hashemite and Princess Dr. Nisreen El Hashemite of Iraq. Uh, Solon was not only uh, looking to the future, but he was a strategic, uh, looking at strategic foresight. Uh, and I believe that's a topic that's being discussed in uh, the context of the Summit for the Future. A suggestion for your consideration. Uh, the uh, UN Environment Program over two years held a series of consultations uh, on the Coalition on Digital Environmental uh, Sustainability, which was a follow-up to the UN Secretary General's Roadmap on Digital Cooperation. Uh, it might, and this, uh, the two reports and Plan of Action or Program of Action um, were launched at uh, Stockholm Plus 20 in June of 2022. There may be some very interesting areas of overlap uh, for um, examination uh, because there, there are member states, there are private sector, there are UN agencies such as ITU in the follow-up. So it's just a suggestion for consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciated the Solon reference. Thank you. Uh, two, two more questions from the room. Uh, three. So one, two, three, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, this is Moritz Burichter for Switzerland. I have one question. As security standards have developed also since like decades, and uh, encryption and decryption standards have become better and more sophisticated. I was wondering if we have seen a lot of attack now, decrypt later attacks so far, because um, if an adversary has already stolen 10 years ago data sets, they can now decrypt it much easier because the standards have not been the same. Is this something we have experienced or is it a complete new attack that we are seeing, fearing, discussing? Thank you. 
please. We're just taking all questions at once and then let Zanna reply. Yeah, uh, there's a uh, process in this where they're trying to find the uh, post-quantum algorithms and one funny anecdote is that one of the algorithms that was a candidate uh, for post-quantum uh, cryptography, actually one of, uh, another researcher managed to break that cryptography in like one day using his own laptop. So I think like one lesson for that is that I really agree in your sense of make haste slowly because if you are a country so focused on post-quantum cryptography and just adapt in one of those encryption methods that happen to be breakable in a day, then you'll be opening yourself to a lot of vulnerability. So as a researcher in this kind of field, I just want to like just make a comment saying that there is a process being done to address these kind of issues. So maybe a lot of haste right now might actually bite us in the future. So yeah, that's a comment I want to make. Thank you. Um, please. Yes, uh, Tarja Fernandes, uh, Cyber Ambassador from Finland. Uh, maybe a question, a question to the Secretariat. Uh, um, um, is there a plan how to, this is a very cross-cutting uh, theme. Uh, it's, uh, there are also positive outcomes uh, expected from, from, from this. Uh, also social, I think, uh, uh, impact on, on quite a few losing their jobs uh, with, with these uh, uh, superpowers uh, in, in ICT world. But, but in the, in, let's, let's frame it to the, only to the first committee. Uh, we have quite a long history of arms control, of uh, export control uh, protocols and, 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 and so forth. Uh, cyber uh, uh, responsible state behavior, we, we are quite early still in, in this uh, discussions, uh, maybe in the future in the first committee uh, 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 framework. But how UN uh, Secretary General and the Secretariat see this kind of uh, uh, cross-cutting or dual-use dual uh, technology to be dealt uh, in the framework of uh, United Nations? Um, I'm Tadeusz Chomicki, I'm Cyber Ambassador from Poland. To follow what Tarja said and uh, what Manon also started about the normative uh, elements of this process, because we cannot, I, I understand we cannot, uh, we cannot decide or we cannot foresee for sure where all these things that you are t talking about will happen. Now, as it happens, my best friend uh, during my studies in Oxford in the 80s, was the guy who PhD thesis put the ground uh, for the applying uh, of quantum physics to cryptography. That was in 1988, right? And we're still not there yet, but uh, it's coming and it's coming. Right? Once a year, some of us, we meet a, a big tech in Silicon Valley and they, they're saying it's still not yet there, it's still not yet there. I was six years ambassador in China a long time ago and China was working on that already a long time ago. So I don't want to push you to make a guess when it happens, but it will happen, as we all understand. And the question will follow what Tarja was saying and, and uh, Manon. Uh, shall we start working on the regulations uh, now and how this can be presented uh, to which working group uh, <laughs> and where it can be presented to UN framework, right? Because. A lot of uh, things are not regulated in cryptography. Behaviors we try to sort of discuss about responsible behaviors. But uh, I doubt if we can discuss responsible behaviors once, the, once this technology be available. And once we start discussing that, the process in the UN takes extremely long time to achieve the results. So what was the best way to, to, to approach this problem now to be ready in 10, 15 years from now? Thank you very much for the excellent discussion on this. I'm, I'm happy and it's affirming to, to hear what parts of the presentation has uh, resonated with the group. And I, I like the discussion of how we can build upon the, the normative framework in existence. I'm going to first address the question regarding harvest now to crypt later attacks and then add a comment to the Festina Lente. Uh, contribution. Uh, speaking first to harvest now and decrypt later, there are aspects of this form of attack, I would argue, that are old and new. Uh, we can look to uh, the example from World War II with the efforts around the Enigma project to decrypt 
uh, Axis Power's communications, once that technology was developed, then the, uh, the data that was encrypted was then uh, decrypted to support the military objective. So at the same time, there are areas of overlap with Harvest Now, Decrypt Later. However, what's different about it is that you're, uh, the, the adversary is able to take the information and does not, at this point in time, have a powerful enough quantum computer that is capable of breaking asymmetric cryptographic protocols, running discrete algorithms or prime factorization to support those capabilities. So the data, the data may be meaningless today, but when we have that tipping point of a powerful, crypto-analytically relevant computer, then if I could do a, a, a dramatic example, then the kingdom essentially has fallen. That information that was classified to support sensitive military and intelligence operations has now become known to your adversary. You can't go back in time and retrieve those chess pieces. They've already fallen into the hands of the adversary. Versus post-quantum cryptographic cryptography, putting that into place today to help prevent a scenario like what I've just demonstrated on the floor here. So, thank you. Um, going to your point of Festina Lente, I'm very happy to hear that that uh, motto also resonated with you as a scaffold to talk about what, are, what is an appropriate normative framework here for discussing responsible quantum innovation in this space. How can we work together collectively to support post-quantum cryptographic algorithm? What does that look like? So I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that that framework appealed to you as both a, a researcher and, and thought leader in this space. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, before I, I try at least to, to answer partially uh, the, the second two questions, there's actually a question in the chat that I wanted to, to ask you. Uh, and it reads as follows. Um, the transition from current security and cybersecurity systems to new quantum resistant algorithms will take time of effort, as we discussed. Should we already be working on a roadmap, uh, sp specifically in the critical and information infrastructure, that involves stakeholders so that the transition is safe and smooth? That's a wonderful question. Uh, preparation is a quintessential element of success. Uh, I like that the uh, the person in the chat highlighted the need for exploring a potential roadmap of a, a transition plan for post-quantum cryptography. Uh, transitioning critical infrastructure towards PQC, post-quantum cryptography standards, it's not a minor undertaking. And it's, it's a highly complex and rather delicate uh, challenge as well because it cuts across so many different sectors in the public and private sector and the different categories of risk that are introduced into this. You have this, the timing, the scheduling risk, you have the financial risk associated with the programmatic, the environmental risks, uh, as well as the technical risks as well. How do we address the unique challenges presented by older legacy systems in upgrading them and fortifying them with post-quantum cryptography? So as an initial planning framework, going to Festina Lente, uh, policymakers, I would suggest, should focus on addressing these considerations and engaging with many different stakeholders, groups, uh, and nations to build trust around upgrading vulnerable systems and infrastructure. Um, in terms of the timeline for developing a crypto-analytically relevant computer, again, uh, going back to Solon of Athens, no one knows the future with certainty. Um, certain groups have <laughs> estimated that within the next 10 to 20 years, uh, the environment may change in which we could have a crypto-analytically relevant computer. A running joke in this space is that it's the next 10 years, the next 10 years that we'll have that computer that is a quantum computer that is all powerful, capable of breaking um, modern asymmetric cryptographic protocols. So I thought I'd bring in a special tool today to help us answer that question. When will we have a modern, mm -hmm. <laughs> when will we have a modern quantum computer capable of breaking asymmetric encryption? Ask again in the next 10 years. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. So um, in terms of the, the, the questions about how can all this come together, so uh, Unidir is not part of the, of the Secretariat, so I cannot speak on behalf of it uh, or on behalf of the SG, but uh, I see colleagues from ODA in the room, so they might be taking notes and perhaps come back to you on that specifically. But uh, uh, I, I want to make two, two comments. First is that, um, we've seen how with the Summit of the Future, the Global Digital Compact, the new Agenda for Peace, there are now 
you know, the, the concept or the issue of new technologies is, is and particularly digital one, is, is popping up in a variety of different, uh, uh, of different environments and, and, and fora. And I think it is going to be, particularly for a technology like quantum, similarly uh, uh, AI, um, leveraging uh, or navigating, if you want, the overlap between what the first committee is concerned about and uh, what all of these other more encompassing uh, uh, fora are going to be uh, concerned about is important because the, the dual use nature of this technology means that it's going to be hard for the first committee to look only at the security aspect without at least listening or being aware of what is being discussed on in, in other tables. So I think this is important. And I also want to say that the you know g g going back to the, the fact that the, the PhD that started all this was 1988. I think in that case, artificial intelligence, I think, is a, is a fitting cautionary tale because the, the concepts of artificial intelligence or many of the algorithms, you know, they're not new. They've been around for decades. But they need a technology to catch up. And the moment at which technology caught up and computing power got to the point that it is today and data got to the point you know the availability of data you know allowed those those models to be trained and then run we saw them you know we, we saw artificial intelligence you know picking up in pace so quickly that now we're, we're we're trying to catch up so this wouldn't be the first time that we were facing with a technology that we know was coming for decades Nevertheless, we haven't done much to prepare for it when it happens. Uh, but I don't want to close on a negative note, so I'm not going to go back to, to Manon and ask if you have any uh, concluding remarks on how we could potentially take this forward in this forum. Um, if I had the answer to that, I think uh, everyone would be very happy. Uh, but I don't. But what I do um, uh, take from the discussion today, uh, indeed, is that there's it's, it's a whole ecosystem discussing this from various angles, and it's something that we see also in our own national systems and as EU in, at, at EU level, that there's so many people involved and in looking at this topic from different discussions. How do you unravel that spaghetti, right? And where do you start? Um, and there, I also noticed that today there's two discussions running sometimes at the same time. So one is about the technology itself. What is it? What can it do? Like, what are all the opportunities that arise from it? How does it work? Uh, and then secondly, uh, how, you know, how do we actually address it in the context of international security? Um, and that's something that I hope that the discussions also uh, being now uh, proposed under the APR, and again, I, uh, we, we very much promote that, will help us unravel that spaghetti and will help us on one hand to understand that ecosystem and understand the technology better in order to then have discussions about how can we address it in the context of uh, international security and how does the United Nations framework for responsible state behavior apply to it. So uh, that's something that we will continue to, to promote. I will take this also back to Brussels and see with the colleagues whether we can uh, contribute to that discussion, including through uh, the projects uh, and expertise such as uh, ZANAS and, and others around the room. Uh, and I hope that uh, we can work on this uh, together to make sure that we retain and maintain peace and security, uh, including uh, in the context of uh, these new technologies. So, thank you. Thank you, Monon. And um, just to say that w the discussion today, this, this breakfast meeting, is, a, is just the beginning of the work that we're, we'll be doing on this topic. Together with Zana, we're working on a paper that we hope to release in early fall uh, that will explore quantum technologies across a variety of applications, cybersecurity being one, but not the only one. So you'll see more from us on this, uh, on this topic. Um, I just would like to, to wrap up the meeting. We're running out of time. And thank you so much for your patience. We started a little bit later, but thank you so much for uh, sticking with us for a few minutes past the, the end time. And uh, I wish you a great rest of the day and hope to see you uh, this afternoon for our afternoon side event in this room. <laughs> thank you. Right.